Welcome back, guys. It's your host, The Traveling Bee. And now we are in Danville, Virginia. I know it's been a little bit of a break, uh -huh. but I thought I'd give you guys a tour around. It's been about 14 years since I've been here. They've got quite a large collection. Not like Bobbington and a few other places I've been, but definitely good if you're local to the NC Virginia area. We're gonna start out with a classic that everyone really loves here. We're gonna start out with the old Panzer IV here. Classic backbone of the German army here. Classic piece of armor. And the backstory to this bad boy is, is apparently after the war was over, the French had a large surplus of these in which it was then sold to the Syrians to make good with their, I guess if you say the promises with the Middle East. And with that being said, the Israelis knocked it out and sold it back to the United States. And here it is in its rusted up condition. She needs a little love, but at least she's back on American soil. So as you can see that we have here, this is actually a very rare prototype that the Germans at the high command of the Oberkommando West units came up with to attack enemy U.S. troop transports that were landing on Omaha Beach. And in fact, the French tried to use this to attack the uh, Indians in the French Indian War. Um, I'll tell you, who are you? Go back to the ward, please. I, I, folks, I apologize. This man, every time I turn around, he's always bothering me. He was at Normandy. He was at several other events I went to. He just, it just, it can I, can I have a hug? No, that's how you get, can, no, can I, have a I ain't into that. So anyway, over here, go away. Go home. Go back to the mental ward. Sorry about that, folks. Whew! Now, let's jump into the future a little bit. This bad boy right here, I remember a gentleman at my church, Mr. Ken Powell, Colonel Powell, sir, actually spoke about this tank that he used in Desert Storm. This here is the M60 Patton. Came into service in the late 50s, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and there's several different variants, but this bad boy, this was the Mac Daddy all the way up until the, I'd say maybe the 70s up until the early 2000s, until it was eventually completely phased out by the Abrams. Great tank and just absolutely part of the backbone of the U.S. Army Armored Corps. Now here we've got one of America's favorites from the 60s and 70s. We have the mule here. Now this little guy, perfect for transporting ammunition, wounded comrades, and as you can see, this one has the M106 recoilless rifle set on it. Um, guys, especially the Marines in the Battle of Huey, as fire teams would actually set these things up, um, put a couple rounds through a house, and then eventually pull back to the safety of cover. These things were wonderful small utility vehicles that especially the Marines and the US Army in Vietnam definitely utilized. Now, folks, we've got a special guest here. This is Mr. William, the old guy that owns the American Armored Foundation Museum here in Danville, Virginia. And I'm gonna give him a uh, chance to give you a little bit of information about the M103 here. Take it away, Mr. Will. Well, why don't you ask me questions and oh. see what you would like to know about it, okay? That's even by the way, I don't own the museum. Oh. Everything here I acquired and gave to the museum. Mm -hmm. The man who dies with the most toys doesn't win. Tax man cometh. The man who has the use of all the toys has all the fun, except he can not sell them. That's the way to go. So I built everything and gave it to the museum. Folks, you heard it exactly. I like the, the way that sounds. Hmm. Well, first question is, is uh, when did this beast come into production? The M103 was really the last foray of the U.S. military for the heavy tank, going by the actual concept of light, mediums, and heavies, right? Which no thing ever really met those criteria. So if the tank couldn't meet the criteria, they just changed the criteria instead of the tank. So what is a heavy tank and a medium and a light? It depends on who's talking about it at what time. The M103 was the last official designation of an American tank called a heavy tank. Okay, all right. Uh, the Pershing was considered a heavy tank because we had the Sherman was a medium, right? But when the M48s and the 60s came out, that whole thing became a blur. It's just a they actually renamed them main battle tanks to kind of round that, okay? But this is the last one. The M103 is essentially about 10 tons heavier than your M4860 series. Uh, but what it was is back in those days, the M48 90 millimeter gun. This had a moose 120 millimeter gun way before we adopted the 105 and then the 120. So in its day, this was the big banger on the block. The and it was impressive. But we built it out of fear because of the Russian tank program had things like the T10 tank. There were heavy tanks, the Joseph Stahl in the series, okay? Mm -hmm. They really scared the living crap out of us, okay? And if they have it, we have to have it. That's how arms are, okay? Remember, it's all about men and women, how they perceive things in machoism. No one wants to be the guy with the little, on the, no, the less on the block, okay? <laughs> so that's what it became. But did it really have a tactical use? No, it really didn't, okay? But oddly enough, the, and the Army didn't want it. They said, we don't see a tactical use for it, okay? Our 4860 series will do the job. But the Marines liked them. 
And the Marines don't usually have something that's that heavy, but they have a credo on the Marines. They got it, whatever they have, they have to be able to move it by boat. And they had a landing craft that could handle this thing. So they took them. And they loved it because they said, wow, we got a big moose ass gun. This is good for bunker busting. Hey. The Marines always figured that the combat they're usually gonna be is bunker busting, not shooting enemy tanks, okay? All right, so in most of their tank combat, it's always been tank against ground fortifications, not tank against tank. Mm -hmm. The few tanks they ever shot at in their career was in World War II, a couple little shoebox Japanese tanks, and a couple times in the Korean War, they go up against a T-34, 85, occasionally, okay? So very real, but boy, they get up, it's a lot of bunkers. That was a good gun for a bunker bust. But the M103 is unique. Doesn't have a bow gun position, as your modern tanks look like. Has a bow, it's called bull bows. It looks like the M48, mm -hmm. but it stars a five-man crew, because it has two loaders inside. Mm -hmm. It doesn't fire a fixed projectile, meaning projectile shell casing, big round like this. Oh, yeah. It actually has a separate projectile and a separate powder charge, okay? Oh, wow. So one would do the projectile, one loader would handle that. So she was back to a five-man crew. Well, the Army got jealous, and typically the Marines get all the hand-me-downs, and they always do. Guys who go first to the Marines, and they always get the, the leftover old crap. Go figure that one. <laughs> it's always the way it's been for some unknown reason. Oh, yeah. But the Army put their tail between their legs, and went to the Marines and said, gee, guys, would you give some of these things tanks back? So the Marines gave them a, the equivalent, I believe it was two tank battalions worth, but I'm not exactly sure it was two, it might have been more, but not that much more of it was, yeah. okay? And the Army had them, and they felt a little better because now they had the big thing again, okay? Again, that male macho thing kicking in. And after a while, they all got a reality check saying it just really didn't have too many utilitarian uses. So, and the more weapon systems you have, the more you have to maintain and train for. So it, it's, it's a diminishing return. So basically, they realized that you could upgun the 48s from 90s to 105. And the 105 was a very effective gun based on, I believe, the British L7, which was a very effective tank gun. Right. Okay. And they pretty much went that route. And then later on, they went with 120, like on, you know, like the Owen Abrams went yep. first to a 105. Yeah. And then it went to a 120 because the 120 was improved. And that was a hell of a good slug gun. Okay. Oh, yeah. But in a day, you're talking about in the, you know, in the 50s to the 70s when this thing was, because it had a, a range of years, okay, was, wow, <laughs> that's a big-ass gun on a tank, okay, oh, yeah. all right? But the Russians had a couple like that, and it scared the crap out of us, even though the Russian tanks, that like, they were so small inside and cramped, you could only carry like 10 or 20 rounds, I forget what it is, okay, so right. how much of a threat is it going to be? And you can only load them so fast without getting fatigued, so really, you know, you, when you really look at it, something looks really scary, was it really a battlefield threat? Well, in the military-industrial complex, you got to have what the other guy has and always do one up better. You know the other guy did something stupid. It's true, <laughs> it don't <is> matter. <laughs> the solution is I can out stupid you. <laughs> there you go. All right? But well. find one. Go on, take this planet apart and find one. The only 103 I knew that was in private hands used to be in the Jacques Littlefield's tank museum before he died and okay. his collection got broken up. Mm -hmm. Where it went, I don't know. Most of his collection was given away or went overseas. But yeah. I, he had one, okay? And I, I am unaware of any other 103s in private hands. And this is a famous tank because this came off the front lawn along with my M41 Walker Bulldog from Tank Automotive Command, Tacom's front lawn. That's Tank Headquarters USA. Yeah. They had it on their lawn and said, you know, this tank is not topical anymore. It's obsolete. So is the M41. We want an Abrams out there and we want a Bradley. And we got to get rid of these old dinosaurs. But you can't get these things from the government unless you have a government license. I'm one of the few guys in the world that has, it's actually called a certification, yeah. not a license. And I have it. So, and they said, I could apply for it and get them, but I had to move them their way, the government way, which means the stupid way, okay? <laughs> they were on 150 feet of lawn on, and they looked at that big office building, it was their headquarters, and they said, no, you can't pull them off that lawn, you gotta crane them out of here, we can't have you disturb the lawn. Uh, for what it takes to crane these mothers out of here, I could give you five sawed yards over and over again, but nope, nope, they had to do it the stupid way, so no one even wanted to consider it, I said, 103 to 41? Shit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it your way. I don't know what the hell. <laughs> no, I think the term is WTF. <laughs> okay. All right, so, uh, so I got a nice big commendation from Tank Command for you know, you know, getting in them their, their bill to get their Abrams and their Bradley on their front lawn without disturbing that damn grass. Okay. okay. Hey, let's take home some front lawn piece for many, many years. Okay. But there she is. This is the, the final. <laughs> Hear that? Okay. Anyway, this is the final version. This is the dieselized version, which even made the Marines more in love with it because the Marines have a fuel system that's based on bunker or diesel fuel. This was diesel. Okay. So when it went to diesel, it was even more popular for the Marines, although it was really on the end of the life cycle for the Marines, as far as I remember. Okay. But it gave it an extra 
set of lungs, if you will, okay? Perfect. An extra life. So if you look at the back, she has a slat grill, typical of the 48 to 60 for the diesel. Nice. Okay, it wasn't a gasser, okay, a gas tank. That old 48A1 over there is a gasser. That was the old term for it, the old gas engine tank. Okay? Oh, yeah. Which is unique because that's my last name. So I'm named after tanks or hot rods. Back in the old days, in the <laughs> 50s, you had a hot rod that had special fuel yep. and called the gasser. <laughs> okay? All right. Well, in the military, tank gas or diesel, right? Yep. The gasser. So the gasser, the name comes alive. But there she is. She's alive. She lives. Okay? Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. And folks, we're running out of time. We're going to hit one more that's America's favorite, and then we'll have to do a part two when I get a chance to come back. We're running low on time. we got to hit the beach, Marines. Let's move! Just kidding, guys. Here we've got a classic little piece called the LVT-4. A uh, wonderful amphibious air trap used by the Marines. However, the LVT-4, which had the turret on, was a lot more safer and a lot more beloved. These bad boys were everywhere from Iwo Jima to Okinawa to Tarawa to Guadalcanal to Saipan, you name it, they were there. If you wanted to get boots on the beach, this is the way to go. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's an American favorite, but folks, we're about to get run out of here gonna be back i promise we're gonna have a part two and this will be continued we gotta go let's run ah! well folks that's the end of a uh, really really unique event uh we finally have visited the danville tank museum the american armored foundation as well oh no we didn't get to tell you about the talk the talk we didn't get to tell you about the talk the talk